we are in the beginning of our Lenten journey. And after Ash Wednesday service, we have four Sundays before we get to holler Hosanna to the son of David. And then we're followed by the waiting and the wailing and the gnashing of teeth that is Good Friday. And then on to celebrating our risen Lord. And for some of us, we think of Lent as an introduction, a preamble to what we are really looking forward to, chocolate bunnies and Easter ham, a short break from the doom and gloom of our existence, and the joyful gratitude of the resurrection. Others of us have come from backgrounds where the biggest question is, what are you giving up for Lent? And the frequent answers are chocolate, Pepsi or Coke, depending, fried foods, and one of my friends quite bluntly said booze. And I'm really glad that I went to that wine tasting last week. However, I want to encourage us to let Lent be its own thing, not a preamble or introduction, not the work before the weekend or the preparation before the party, and that this journey, I invite us to travel with some intentional paths of introspection and discernment, both communal and personal, that will on our, our longing to, as Psalm 25 said, make us to know God's ways, teach us God, lead us God, guide us. And this all begins with the Gospel of Mark and his no-frills account of Jesus' ministry. Mark seems to have taken a style of writing that is like the old black and white TV show Dragnet and Joe Friday saying, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. <laughs> we begin with that familiar voice crying in the wilderness in the appearance of John the Baptist. And unlike Matthew's account, there is no sermon there's no calling the Pharisees' names like brood of vipers. There are no images of axes at the root of trees that don't bear fruit. No talk of winnowing and then burning the shaft. In Mark's account, John is simply proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. There were people from the whole Judean countryside and they were traveling to hear John. They confess their sins. John baptizes them. And John says, sure, I'll, I'll baptize you with water, but the one coming after me, that one, is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And I'm not good enough to even untie his sandals. And who should come along but Jesus, the very one to whom John refers? In Mark's stripped-down account, there's no conversation with Jesus, no back and forth between Jesus and John. John baptizes Jesus, boom, one and done. Jesus comes up out of the water, and he, Jesus, sees the heavens torn apart, and the Spirit descends on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying to Jesus, you are my son, my beloved, with you I am well pleased. Let's stop Mark's gallowing pace here for a minute and digest the story. It appears that the only one who sees the heavens torn open is Jesus. It is only Jesus who hears the voice of belonging, the voice of belovedness. Other translations say, you are my son, chosen and marked by my love, the pride of my life, or thou art my son, my beloved, on thee my favor rests. The descriptions, my beloved, my chosen, my son, marked by my love, I am proud of you, I am well pleased, I rest my favor on you. This is my beloved child in whom I delight. Can you imagine the power of this moment when Jesus hears this affirmation, when Jesus knows beyond a shadow of a doubt his belovedness and his belonging? I was nine when I was baptized, and I don't have any real clear memories except the cold water and the, and the pastor saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. There was no tearing open of the heavens. 
There was no little dove, not even a bluebird on my shoulder. There was no naming of belovedness, no claiming of belonging. There was no indication of God's delight in me. I doubt I'm alone in that experience. But what if? What if, just what if, our baptism is no less potent, our baptism is no less compelling, our baptism is no less spirit-filled, and no less God's delight? What if our baptism is perhaps less about saving us from our sins and ultimately the burning fires of hell, and more about our divine selection and empowerment? What if? What just what if our baptism is about our personal salvation as we are in relationship to other beloved children of God, to others in whom God delights? What if, just what if our baptism and our baptisms is about our belovedness and our belonging to God and our belonging to each other. What if, just what if it is about our communal divine selection and our communal power? I invite you to sit with those possibilities for a minute as we explore the next part of the story. After this beautiful story of baptism, the text reads, And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. Full stop. What? Jesus has this amazing experience of loving affirmation, the fullness of God's presence, and then the Spirit drives Jesus into the wilderness to temptation by Satan and to contend with wild beasts. Now talk about a bait and switch. So this is what happens when God delights in us? Jesus gets no heads up, no time to pack, no itinerary, no GPS to the closest rest stop, no preparation whatsoever. And this whole thing about the spirit drove him doesn't sound like he even had time to consent, certainly no informed consent. There were no weighings of pros and cons. Could you just tell me what kind of temptations might be out there? What kind of wild beasts? Please, no snakes. Maybe this is time to take another breath. Jesus ends up in the wilderness for 40 days with Satan and some feral beasts to experience temptations. We can read the descriptions of those temptations in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, but here, here in Mark, we can let our imaginations run wild with everything we fear about ourselves and everything we fear about each other. When we let our imaginations run wild, thinking about those temptations and about those frightening beasts, quite frankly, the temptations in the other Gospels feel kind of tame. We have now just entered up a grown up, menacing version of Marie Sendak's land of where the wild things are. The spirit that spoke to Jesus of love and belonging, preciousness and delight, identity and purpose, is the same spirit that drove Jesus into the wilderness, into the wildness into the arms of Satan and temptation. And it is that same spirit that was ever present to Jesus and provided the angels that waited on him. We follow Jesus into this journey. And these early 
days of his ministry are not so unlike our lives. It seems we find ourselves driven into uncharted territory or uncharted territories, unprepared and maybe without our informed consent. We can cower behind the rocks hoping the beast and Satan won't find us. Or we can trust the spirit, the God who delights in us, the God created us for God's purpose, the God who created us for each other. We can trust the spirit that sends angels when we need, least expect them and when we most need their witness and aid. We can trust the spirit whose words of belonging and belovedness, of delight and empowerment can dry our eyes, encourage our spirits, bind up our brokenness and deepen our love for God, for each other, and for this world that God loves so much. We can trust the spirit that drives us to places that we do not aim to go. And if we let the spirit drive us, then something amazing just might happen as it did with Jesus. Jesus comes out of that wilderness, out of that wildness. Jesus comes away from Satan and temptations, out of the clutches of the beast to announce, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Jesus comes out of that wilderness that wildness, able to draw on his belonging and belovedness in order to show us the kingdom of God. Jesus comes out and immediately embarks on his mission, his mission from God. Can we together do anything less? Let the spirit drive us. And now we invite you to enter a time of silence and reflection. What is the spirit speaking and stirring in you? Is there a sight, a sound, a phrase, a word, a disagreement or question rising? What is your experience of the spirit's presence and call upon your life? Are you moved to think further or differently, to offer thanks and praise or petition or to confess doubt, wrong or woundedness? How is the Spirit still speaking?